Hello, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sébastien Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. Uh, we're here today with uh, one of our sort of most frequent guests, or our, probably our most frequent guest, or well, guest host, you could say, uh, Sean Jones. She's covered for us regulation many, many times. And so thanks so much for, for joining us today. Uh, it's lovely to be with you guys both again. Um, it's only been, what, two or three weeks since we all met up in, in Berlin, and now here I am back on the show. It's wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, for those who don't know, or for those who haven't listened to the show for a long time, uh, we've done uh, quite a few episodes on Bitcoin regulation. And actually, when we kind of got started a, a year ago, uh, we, we did quite a few. Uh, I think it was, it was a topic that kept coming up a lot. And, and Sean, you were often uh, so generous to join us because uh, I think you understand this, uh, the Bitcoin regulation better than, well, almost anyone. And uh, you also was generous to you know record some great interviews on Bitcoin regulation with uh, with a lot of people at Bitcoin conferences. But somehow in the last few months, last three four months, we haven't done a lot of that. So it's I think it will be a good chance today to kind of dive back in and see what has been going on. Probably it's just that that regulation is such a boring subject for for people in the exciting field of uh, of. Um, Bitcoin and digital currencies, so of course, you know. Um, uh, but you're right, there, there's been an awful lot going on, and I think there's a lot to catch up on. Yeah, I mean, we, I, we, I and Sebastian were, were talking about this a little bit before, this sort of question of who cares about Bitcoin regulation <laughs> and, and why, right? Well, certainly like me, but... Um. <laughs> well, right, I mean, there's obviously people who are just sort of, you know, the more kind of a futuristic type uh, a person who thinks, uh, you know, sees cryptocurrencies and thinks like, oh, this is amazing. It's going to change the world so much. There's going to be like smart robots, like moving around cars and, and all kinds of things like that. And then you might say, ah, regulation. And that is extremely boring, right? And then I think there's uh, also the people who are more kind of libertarian leaning, who favor decentralization, a sort of complete decentralization, you know, going offshore, trying to build things that can't be regulated. Uh, and then to those, also the regulation questions aren't so interesting. And then I think there's the sort of third group that's more interested in uh, making Bitcoin happen and sort of integrate it into existing system, getting people to actually use it uh, like today and, and next year and the next few years. And, and then regulation is very, very important. And then especially also anyone who's trying to start a Bitcoin startup, a super important topic. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think there are these different camps and you know, for some this is a really, really important, interesting topic. And for some it's, it's just something that's like, why are we talking about this? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's what you say is is very true. I think, though, that the two extremes, in a way, do come together, um, and they come together because um, I guess everybody's interested in seeing wider adoption um, for for this wonderful experiment to work. Um, you need lots of people to use it, and uh, in the real world, if one's pragmatic, um, you you cannot escape that 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 people the people who are going to use it live in places, they occupy places, they they their lives function in in places, and and places have, generally speaking, laws and governments and so on, and so whatever your ideological standpoint, whatever your political standpoint, um, you still come back to the reality that you've got to. Uh, recognize that, that that regulation in one form or another exists, especially around uh, financial services of any sort, um, generally, and so it's inescapable. And so um, addressing it and getting it addressed, getting regulation addressed, if I use the word properly, well, suitably for the industry, suitably for users, if it's not over-regulated, if it works um, and it helps encourage uh, wider adoption, then it's, 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 I suppose you could say it's a necessary evil if you want to look at it from that point of view, but it's there, we're not going to, we can't escape it if we want this thing to, to, to be widely accepted. 
I, I do agree that it, it is a reminder that we live in places, for one oh. thing. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, no, but what I mean is, so no, I'm, I'm, I'm joking, of course, but what, what when, when I hear about Bitcoin regulation, I mean, my, my initial reaction is, really, now? I, now is the time to be regulating this. And when, when reading, so we'll, we'll be talking about this uh, digital currency's response to the call for information issued by the Her Majesty the Queen's Treasury <laughs> during the show. Uh, that sounds so fun. Um, one thing that kind of stands out is we're trying to protect consumers, right? Which consumers exactly are you trying to protect? I mean, on, on the one hand, the regulatory bodies are saying this is a nascent technology, that no one's using it, and also there's a um, high probability that this will never gain mass adoption. And on the other hand, we're saying we need to protect consumers. So there's like sort of a, I don't know, it doesn't, it's not compatible in my opinion, but anyway. I'm not sure that it's incompatible, but, but you make a, a very good point. Um, and I suppose the consumers are the citizens, the... Um, depositors, the users of these um, crypto funds and so forth. And um, I don't know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but we've certainly, particularly in the, in the West, become accustomed to having our um, governments and others um, make sure that we're not ripped off and that uh, um, businesses are run uh, where they take you know, our money. Uh, that those businesses are run prudently, efficiently, not wildly speculatively, uh, that the people who look after our funds are competent, uh, that they're not thieves. Um, and of course, in the Bitcoin world, we've seen all of that. We've seen examples of incompetence. We've seen I examples of theft, fraud. And we've seen all of those things. I think only in the last uh, week or two, we've we've had another major incident where, um, uh, you know, where where um, fools were parted from their money um, because the the people they gave their money to just walked off with it, a few million, and you know. <laughs> this will continue to happen, and we're used to having other people look after it for us. Take that right, right. Do the so I mean, the thing is, I, I don't consider myself to be a libertarian. But on this point here, it, it seems, first of all, we are seeing uh, these issues being addressed in the Bitcoin space. You know, I mean, for example, uh, you know, let's say Voltor that we, we've been talking with, uh, you know, they do like, you know, Bitcoin exchanges on the blockchain, multi sig mm -hmm. starts being used. Like, there are all those things that are happening in, in the Bitcoin space addresses. Of course, they're not perfect. Of course, people are still going to get ripped off, and of course, some people not use it, etc. But you know, they are being addressed uh, in some ways, and I think in the future we will, uh, it will be standard for Bitcoin exchanges to be built in a way that they can't steal people's money. Uh, and then at the same time, uh, regulators and governments are trying to do things to, I guess, accomplish the same thing so people can't lose their money. But personally, I just don't think the way governments tend to approach this is particularly effective, right? So, I mean, it may, even, even if we assume people will follow it and it has a positive effect, it also has hugely negative effects on innovation, on the ability to just get things done, try out new products, etc. So, I mean, I think on, on the balance, my view, this is mostly uh, a negative effect in general. Um. I think the first wave of um, regulatory reaction um, probably um, only looked through the lens of the existing financial services world and how that is regulated and tried to apply the same kinds of rules and the principles. Um, I suppose a good example of that might be uh, New York with its bit license proposals and I think we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. But the approach there uh, is very much one of here's the existing sort of framework and we're just going to um, find a way of making Bitcoin businesses fit that existing framework. But we're also seeing governments who are saying, no, this stuff is, is different. It, ha it presents a different set of challenges. Some of the underlying public policy issues are the same, like 
not ripping off investors or depositors or um, consumers. Um, sometimes they're the same because, uh, it, again, it's a public policy issue to um, avoid um, money laundering and terrorist financing and those kind of issues. Uh, those uh, basic objectives are still the same objectives, but this stuff works differently and maybe we need to look at it differently and figure out how we deal with the challenges. And maybe later on we'll talk about um, one of the money laundering bodies is, uh, you know, is sort of reaching out to try and figure out how to do just that. Also, we're seeing differences in different parts of the world. So in Europe, there's a much more consultative approach generally, certainly within the European Union and its institutions, which I know a lot about. I'm speaking to you today from, from Brussels. And the approach here is one of... Um, finding out how this stuff works, how we can still uh, protect citizens, but at the same time um, harness the benefits that this technology brings and perhaps um, uh, some things which we haven't even thought about uh, that it might be able to bring some benefits to society. So we've actually got now governments almost on our side and, and there's some demonstrations of that, some illustrations of that. For example, what's happened in the UK last week with um, some government announcements. Yeah, but I, I find that the, the very fact that you have bodies like the, like the European Union or, you know, this UK, uh, uh, Her Majesty the Queen's Treasury, um, <laughs> issuing these statements saying that we're going to regulate it, we're looking into regulating it, sends some sort of a signal to the people uh, that is not necessarily positive. So to us, we may look at it saying, like, we'll actually read it because we're involved in the space and you know we're interested in this stuff, so we read the thing and we're able to have opinions and stuff about it, but the media will look at it from a completely different standpoint and what the people will interpret it as is they're regulating this and so therefore it must be bad or well, therefore there must be risks and we need to be really careful like so uh, I, I, I mean just talking to people right just talking to people still about Bitcoin now I still get like the same sort of um, um, a priori as I would last year which is drugs uh, money laundering etc and people you know we need to regulate this but, but I'm not sure that any of that is 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 necessarily bad. I mean, the average person um, who isn't um, one of the the, the Bitcoin cognoscenti, if that's the right word, is not part of the the Bitcoin world. It's just an ordinary person, but he's heard about this stuff or she's read about it. Um, thinks it might be interesting. Of course, everybody wants to to make as much money as possible um, by saving costs or by seeing appreciation in value or whatever or whatever with little or no risk, preferably no risk at all. And the average person, certainly in the West, looks to his or her government or authority to protect them from some of those risks. You know, the average person is not going to do their own due diligence about what this stuff called Bitcoin is and how it works and how they might be ripped off. They'll look to central authority to to do that work for them. And so if it's regulated, it actually does um, send a signal that it's something that they can have confidence in. I mean, we all know that banks are regulated, but but you know, and that we all get ripped off by banks, of course. I'm not sure that's actually, tr that's really true. I mean, you have a generation now that is so used to the internet and getting in the information themselves and uh, that I, I don't think necessarily will always look to the state or to some sort of regulatory body for uh, protection and assuming that, you know, we're protected because of this. I, I, especially with the, such a new technology like Bitcoin, I think people that, that, get into the ecosystem or that start getting interested in it um, will do their own homework and know very well that they're not going to be protected by uh, but maybe, people want maybe to be by protected. assumptions. But people want to be protected. Wrong. 
but this is the point, uh, Sebastian. They want to be protected. They don't want to have the the, the worry. Um, I take your point, and I agree with you. Um, it is a changing world, and people are doing things differently than they did in the past, and they are taking a little bit more responsibility for some aspects of their lives. But broadly speaking, we all want to spend as much time as we can um, uh, being entertained or um, communicating with our uh, social through our social networks we don't want to be spending an awful lot of time worrying about whether our and I'll talk about it our money being safe but I'll use our value whatever you want to however you want to see that um, we just don't want to worry about it we want to be able to put it in the bank um, or indeed not even have to put it in the bank have our employer put it in the bank for us and we draw upon it when we need it and we want to think about it as little as possible we don't want to lose value we don't want to lose any of it we don't want any of it stolen and we don't really want to have to think about it now I think there's evidence to suggest that that's still the case um, in the UK where I come from um, laws were passed to make it easier for people to switch their bank accounts. What they found was that uh, over time people tended rarely to switch their bank accounts and it suggested that there wasn't therefore an awful lot of competition, that people were somehow locked into their banking arrangements. And so they passed laws to effectively um, mandate uh, the transfer of uh, or ease of transfer I should say of, of bank accounts you can switch your bank account far more easily today a um, bit like you can switch your mobile phone provider you can switch your bank account and uh, that's been around for a little while now and actually it's hardly made any difference whatsoever people are still not switching their bank accounts and that kind of suggests a certain apathy I don't know if that's the right word but but it suggests that and that folks just don't want to be bothered yeah I mean that's obviously true and I mean I think anybody who believes that magically because now we've got cryptocurrency people are changing and they are taking on more responsibility and they don't want people other people to take care of things for them etc that's you know that's extremely naive and uh, it's you know it's pretty clear people uh, you know people don't want to worry about security people don't want to worry about uh, their money getting stolen people want someone else to take care of it for them I and mean, of course there is that minority that you know uses PGP and uh, you know does their offline backups in the Bitcoin space and all that sort of stuff but uh, this is never going to be the mass and the average person and the average person obviously is going to want that security uh, I mean the the thing is just I have some reservations whether um, it's government regulations <laughs> and documents that's going to get us that but uh, I, I of course do agree with you that people want that yeah and and you're absolutely right I mean we, we trusted governments to look after our monetary system and if you uh, happen to live in Cyprus I, I lived there for four or five years um, and, and left uh, uh, just a year before um, all the banks crashed and um, effectively there was I think about a 40 effectively a 40 percent tax placed levied on on, on people's deposits over a hundred thousand euros um, because the banks had collapsed and and they but before everybody thought that they they were protected by their government who um, and by the you know European Central Bank and by everybody else somebody else there were so many people involved so many regulators you can't believe surely um, you couldn't have a systemic failure of, of the banks and um, and yet it happened so you're right Brian <laughs> no and, and I wasn't suggesting that people aren't People care about being protected. Uh, simply, I think that you know the world is very different from from before. The world is changing, and I don't necessarily agree. The world is changing, but people are not changing, or much less so. Oh, I, can I quote you on that? I like. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> 
No, no you're right. The world is changing. Any, but, you're right. It is changing. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to you from somebody's apartment in Brussels that um, I'm, I'm staying in through Airbnb, and um, the person whose apartment it is has, has entrusted somebody she doesn't know uh, to, to take over her home for a few days. Actually, you're quite right. There, it's a different, it's a different world now. People wouldn't have done that. They do it because of new trust mechanisms, uh, um, reputation mechanisms, and so on and so forth. So you know, you're right. The world which is in this case are not regulated, by the way. It's like, I mean, absolutely. Or, yeah. Good point. However, unfortunately, where money is involved, people. Well, will, I mean, will I don't think that's quite true, right? I mean, Airbnb has a regulatory issues and issues with governments all over the place all the time. I mean, I think they, uh, you know, they have a lot of, they run in a lot of uh, conflicts there as well. And, and yes, obviously, but obviously, Sean, you're right. right? I mean, when it comes to financial transactions and financial services, uh, regulations are much more onerous and complicated than when it comes to housing and renting out rooms to other people. Yeah, but, yeah. It, but, it, but it's true. And in a way, you could say that Airbnb is a kind of regulator. You know, they are on a centralized authority that that manage the reputations. That's true, and and but yeah, to, but to your point, Brian, Her Majesty the Queen is not issuing uh, <laughs> this the, the papers on how that we should regulate uh, you know, the the blossoming uh, sharing economy. No. Um, well, but no, I mean, I think <laughs> Uber and Airbnb and, the, and those companies. I mean, they have a lot of uh, they have. They tackle with uh, issues like this all the time. I mean, sure. No, of yes, course. I, I tell you something even um, more amusing than that. Here in Brussels, um, the, the the local city banned uh, Uber, and uh, the the comp the European Competition Commissioner um, uh, got really rather angry because one. Um, uh, she used to use it, <laughs> and two, it was saving uh, the um, European Parliament and Commission an awful lot of money in uh, in costs. And so, interestingly enough, you had uh, you had the uh, you know the the legislators up in arms against the people who were overregulating and wanted to see it all freed up. Now, there's an interesting um, juxtaposition, isn't there? Absolutely. Uh, so there's. There's lots more to talk about. In fact, we're going to get into this uh, um, response to the call for information issued by Her Majesty of the Queen's Treasury. Uh, when I, whenever I read this, I, I couldn't help but think of like hear uh, Monty Python voices saying, "Her Majesty the Queen has issued a <laughs> some." I, I have to I have to slightly um, correct you because every time you said it, I've smiled la a, a larger and larger. It's Her Majesty's Treasury, which oh, is an old I'm title because you know. <laughs> and, uh, but her queen, the, the the Queen bit doesn't actually appear in there. And I don't and, actually. And think everybody she has says uh, HMRC. Oh no, that's something else. That's Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. Oh, they're, the, they're the they're the tax collectors and okay. uh, uh, and and so forth. And Her Majesty's Treasury is what uh, what yeah, yeah, most yeah. countries yeah, call yeah. the finance ministry. Okay. Well, I, apologies to Her Majesty. <laughs> so we'll uh, we'll get back to that in just a second. Before we do that, we'd like to talk about Shapeshift. Uh, Shapeshift. This is a fast and easy way to buy and sell altcoins. They support uh, up to 25 different altcoins right now, uh, most of which remain unregulated. And um, so it's, uh, it's a really fast and easy way to trade, say you want to buy some Litecoin or you want to send some, uh, some Bitcoins to someone, but you perhaps have some Dogecoin or any other uh, of the currencies that they support. Uh, so uh, let's, um, let's uh, demo, show the screen here. And so as you can see, <clears throat> So you go to shapeshift.io and you can use their currency conversion tool, which is sort of like Google Translate for cryptocurrencies. Uh, you choose the currency you want to convert. So let's say uh, we want to send some. So here are all the currencies they support. Uh, you know, they got BitShares. Uh, they've got uh, Ripple. Recently, they added this Clams coin. If anybody knows what that's that is, that's Dogecoin. I'd love to know what Clams is, and Dogecoin. And so we want to send some Bitcoins. We just put a Bitcoin address, enter the amount, hit start, and then you get this QR code. You send, in this case, Litecoin to that address, and uh, the Litecoins would get sent to that person's Bitcoin address, or yours, or, or anybody else's, for that matter. 
Um, so it takes about 30 seconds to do. It's uh, very fast, and uh, they only take a small fee. So it's already included in the price uh, when you're setting the when you're setting your your currency. Um, so what's great about Shapeshift is that they don't require any personal information. Uh, you don't have to give them your email address even, and um, so it, your information stays perfectly safe and private. So give it a try, and we'd like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Web Center Bitcoin. All right, so back on uh, Her, Majesty's, Her Majesty's Treasury response to call for information on digital currencies. Uh, so this is a, you brought this to our attention earlier this week, or I think it was late last week. When was it? Issues? It came out, it came out on um, Wednesday last week, so right. just over a week ago. And to, can you just broadly uh, describe the context in which this, this document was uh, released and what it means? Absolutely. Uh, firstly, the, the, this paper was published um, as part of um, uh, the budget announcements. The the UK has a government sort of sets an annual budget, although partway through the year it, it kind of has a, um, a sort of review. And uh, the government um, uh, announcement, our Chancellor of the Exchequer, our Finance Minister, um, Announces a whole set of measures for the for the ensuing year and beyond. Um, perhaps I should just make it clear that although this budget announcement comes out at this particular time every year um, in the UK, there's an election um, in May, so in about uh, five weeks' time or thereabouts, and um, it's going to be a, it's one of the closest. Um, run elections for a very long time, so we have no idea whether. Um, this party and this chancellor are still going to be in power in a few weeks' time, and indeed this budget will not be discussed in Parliament until after the election. So, um, it's essentially it's a budget proposal for the for the ensuing period. Um, by way of history, in the summer last year, the very self same chancellor George Osborne stood up at a, a, a major innovation. Uh, um, event in Canary Wharf in uh, London and announced um, that uh, he, he, he was basically supporting um, uh, fintech industries and wanted to see uh, the UK prosper and mentioned specifically amongst one or two other areas, mentioned specifically digital currencies. Uh, he announced that there was going to be uh, some work done through the rest of the year, investigating, you know, how it could best be supported and where, if and to what extent, um, virtual currencies would need regulating. And that work continued through uh, last year. Uh, the Treasury, which is effectively you know, his ministry, put out a call for information, which was responded to, I think, by around 120. Um, organizations and businesses, so um, key industry players uh, submitted there. And not just from um, the UK, but from all around the world. Indeed. Right? I mean, uh, submissions were made from um, businesses that were outside the UK, but obviously most of them had aspirations to do business um, in the UK, which is why they bothered to do, to do it. Uh, you had organizations like the um, UK Digital Currency Association make. Um, a very substantive submission, and other bodies like the British Bankers Association, you know, the um, uh, 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 the evil bankers put in a <laughs> uh, put in a a submission, and um, the Treasury uh, chewed on all of this and um, gave it some thought, and the paper that it published last week was the outcome. And essentially, it uh, highlighted a number of um, key measures. Um, the uh, the first um, was um, the the regulatory one. The uh, government said that um, it felt that um, virtual currency exchanges, businesses at the interface with fiat currencies, should be subject to um, the anti-money laundering regulation and framework that exists um, 
uh, for pretty much all other businesses and that they would start a more detailed consultation on how that should be done but essentially um, it's government policy to to bring uh, Bitcoin exchanges into the uh, uh, into the anti-money laundering regime. Um, secondly, and um, perhaps a little surprisingly, the government announced 10 million pounds of public money to go into digital currency research. So here was a government actually throwing public money at a time of fairly stringent austerity. Um, throwing might be perhaps the wrong expression, but certainly allocating money uh, to uh, research into digital currencies. And um, one of the one of the entities that it was going to do this through is a, um, um, a sort of amalgam of some of the main universities like Oxford and Cambridge and um, University College London and Edinburgh and others, um, but also making that basically trying to stimulate research in how the underlying technologies could be better used and be used to advantage and this was you know uh, seen as a broadly supportive measure something that you know I think is probably the first government to say we're actually giving money to to um, uh, to to an industry involved in virtual currencies it's brilliant news um, and so that was the, uh, the the sort of second and the final sort of key point that came out was um, support for a self-regulatory standards-based regime for the industry as a whole. So instead of saying there should be government regulation of the digital currency um, businesses, it should be something that the businesses take care of themselves through standards and it was an, and it announced an initiative with the British Standards Institution which is one of the uh, sort of global leaders in, in, in standards organizations to uh, help come up with uh, the detail of that uh, and that's actually work that's being done in conjunction um, with the UK Digital Currency Association to, to come up with standards that can be adopted um, by an industry and so avoid government intervention. So broadly positive stuff I think. So uh, I mean I think the interesting thing here is if we contrast that to, to some other countries in Europe and maybe around the world so like let's say for example um, in Germany there has been no statement of that sort in any way, right? I mean, I think the, the government tends to be uh, not supportive of cryptocurrencies, right? And when it comes to regulation, they're like, oh, it, it needs to be, it needs to be put in these existing categories. You need to to comply with that. Uh, I mean, there's even the question of the VAT. We won't have time to go into that, but um, that's still sort of looming and I think the German government as far as I understand has often been sort of of the stance that uh, yes there should be VAT applied on that uh, totally irrespective and totally ignoring the repercussions that would have for a cryptocurrency startups for the, the innovation and all the positive things that can come here and, and I guess the nice thing here about the UK is that they do take a, a different stance and, and show much more openness and uh, more positive approach. I think the thing that struck me most um, was that there was a more or less unified government policy approach. Uh, they talk about joined up government in the UK. Um, so this was government policy rather than just one regulator giving a perspective on um, this stuff that's digital currencies. Um, and this is quite interesting because I don't think I have seen anywhere in the world to date a government that had a total, you know, a, a holistic policy that it could apply. This is the first instance of a government having any policy apart from possibly um, Russia which um, seems to have a policy that's that's anti digital currencies all the statements I've seen have tended to come from individual um, you know regulatory bodies 
this is the first instance I've encountered of a government having a total policy, a, not just a tax policy, not just a, a banking or payment systems um, regulation policy. Um, and so they have taken the whole approach rather than um, and, and looked at all the consequences and in, uh, intended and otherwise. So, so Sean, uh, what are the consequences going to be of that? Is it going to be easier for Bitcoin startups in the UK to get bank accounts or to do business there? Um, definitely, I think it's going to be. Uh, it's a signal to say that 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 the UK is a country um, that is going to wel be welcoming um, for. Bitcoin businesses. We still are struggling in the UK with uh, with the banking industry, but there are developments that are going to be changing that, I think. And taken together, I think we'll see um, this sort of government endorsements, um, this regulation for money laundering, um, all sort of play reasonably well in the ears of, of, of bankers. Uh, but more importantly, the the problem that Bitcoin businesses are having in the UK is not strictly speaking a problem of access to banking. It's more particularly a problem of access to the clearing system. In other words, getting money into and out of their exchanges, for example. And that is controlled by um, essentially just the big four banks, the mega banks, the big four control all of the clearing system and so long as they are negative on um, virtual currencies for a variety of reasons that probably we don't have time for today um, because of that it means that even the challenger banks who have to go through the big banks the big four to access the clearing system um, they have not been able to make progress in opening accounts or maintaining accounts for Bitcoin businesses. However, there is a new regulatory regime, a competition regime, uh. starting next month in April. Uh, in fact, um, uh, the new regulator uh, for that is the payment systems regulator. So and she will open up access. She's already made that clear. That's part of her remit. Um, uh do you have any insight into why those four banks are so hostile against uh, providing access to the clearing system for Bitcoin companies? Um, I think it's part of um, uh, an, a, a, a policy of de-risking, um, which banks have been doing to um, reduce their exposure to regulatory but that, risk. I mean, but that is complete nonsense. No, I mean, there's obviously no risk in like letting some people. Deposit some bitcoins on a big, uh, some a thousand, a few thousand pounds or a million pounds on, on bitcoin exchanges. It's the regulatory risk. So the way that anti money laundering regulation works pretty much throughout the world is that intermediaries, so banks, for example, are uh, required to um, effectively police the system and report anything that uh, that is suspicious to the authorities um, you know some people in East Germany might find that fairly reminiscent of the way things used to be before um, uh, 89 or whenever it was uh, but essentially the banks are, are, are the government's um, eyes and ears uh, on, on, on um, money laundering and if they fail to to, to to take that responsibility seriously, they get fined. Uh, and so if they're found to have handled laundered money, or money that's destined for, for, for terrorists, then uh, they can be fined, and they can be fined heavily. And so a whole class of business, not just Bitcoin businesses, but for example, remittance businesses, and others who, if you like, mean that the bank are one step removed from the end customer. Um, the banks have greater exposure. There was a big scandal over the last two or three years as the accounts, certainly in the UK, of remittance businesses uh, were closed. And there's the example of um, remittances to Somalia where uh, Somalis who left the country and were working abroad in the UK, in other parts of Europe, in America and so forth would earn money 
to send home because the economy was shot to pieces and that was the only way to feed their families. Um, I think something close on half the economy was dependent on remittances back to the country. Uh, but there was only one banking link, one of the, as it happens, it was Barclays Bank in the UK, I believe, who, who had um, a presence in Somalia. And so all of the remittance businesses had to channel their, their funds through Barclays to get it back into Somalia to feed their families. Uh, but because of the policy of de-risking, because it was seen as um, uh, a riskier class of business to handle because they, you know, they didn't know who'd actually handed this money over and perhaps some of it was destined for terrorists and so on and so forth, which would have exposed the banks to the risk of fines and so forth. Because of all of that, um, they, uh, the banks closed accounts. They closed accounts of these remittance companies and they basically cut off uh, the banking system and the remittances that were going back to feed people. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously a bigger risk to, uh, you know, pay a fine than if, if some people can't feed their families in Africa. I mean, that's a pretty that's a pretty clear choice as a bank, which, which way you're going to go. Well, you know, they've got shareholders, haven't they? Yeah. Um, um, so, you also wanted to talk briefly about the Isle of Man. Uh, I mean, it's it's uh, an area that you've been uh, deeply involved in, and uh, you, you spend a lot of time there, and it has... Uh, it's, I think it's uh, one of those places that nobody's ever heard of uh, before uh, there started being these news and rumors uh, uh, and developments, including a Bitcoin conference over there, that this is now uh, some sort of Bitcoin haven and Bitcoin friendly place where everybody can go and do whatever they want. Uh, at, at least <laughs> that's a little bit the way it was. Uh, touted. So, uh, can you uh, maybe share a bit of an update? What's what's going on there, and and what the situation is looking like? Absolutely. Um, firstly, I, um, you, you're quite right. It isn't a place that a lot of people have heard of, but uh, for those who haven't, it's uh, it's an island of about um, eighty plus thousand people that sits halfway in the Irish Sea between mainland UK, uh, mainland Britain, I should say. Um, uh, uh, so that's England, Scotland, and Wales, and the island of Ireland, um, and 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 it's an entirely independent state. Uh, so it has its own legislature. In fact, it has the oldest parliament on on, on the planet that's still running, and it uh, sets its own laws. It has its own regulatory regime, and it it, it it's been known in the past as an offshore financial centre. And um, it, it is very proud of its reputation as one of the leading um, uh, offshore centers because it diversified from sort of pure offshore financial business into other industries, um, space, biopharmaceuticals, biomedicine, um, uh, uh, I, I, I don't know if many people realize that if they fly on an Airbus, um, the undercarriage was uh, almost certainly built on the Isle of Man, if I understand correctly. They've got a number of niches. One of the niches was e-gaming, uh, and that's proved very successful um, for for the Isle of Man. It accounts, I believe, for about 4% of the island's um, GDP, and they wanted to repeat that success. Uh, with cryptocurrencies. Um, on the contrary, I, um, I wouldn't say they were touting it as something where anybody could come and do anything. On the contrary, they were saying they were very welcoming of uh, reputable businesses that wanted to establish themselves, as they did with e-gaming companies, uh, that wanted to establish themselves, that they would be welcoming and friendly and offer a very friendly um, regulatory environment. And they brought that to, um, to fruition in just the last week. Um, on the 17th of March, so um, just over a week uh, after we're recording this, uh, they passed some amendments to the Proceeds of Crime Act, which is, if you like, their money laundering regulation, uh, 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 legislation that now brings um, a wide range of digital currency businesses um, within the scope of that legislation. Uh, so things like if you are suspicious of one of your clients, customers um, um, 
laundering money or channeling terrorist funds that you have to file a suspicious activity report just as if you were a lawyer or an accountant or a, a casino or a, a real estate agent or someone who sold high value goods. And they've also um, uh, just uh, two days ago uh, passed a new piece of legislation called the Designated Businesses Bill. It's passed through all the stages in the Parliament and it's now going for sort of seal of approval. And here we do come back to Her Majesty because it does actually need um, royal assent. And that should happen in a few months' time. And that piece of legislation um, makes the Financial Services Commission on the island the regulator for anti-money laundering. So Bitcoin businesses uh, that handle other people's money, for example, will need to register with the FSC and they will be subject to the FSC's oversight. So this will be the first real example of Bitcoin businesses being properly um, regulated uh, by some sort of entity. Now, do you have any idea of what additional overhead and costs might be associated to then opening a Bitcoin, a Bitcoin exchange in uh, in the Isle of Man or any sort of Bitcoin business? Actually, um, the Isle of Man will probably be an awful lot less expensive um, by a massive amount uh, from New like York. Instance. New York. So, I mean, the 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 registration fee that I believe has been. Um, uh, been uh, laid down is something like 500 pounds and probably a similar amount I would imagine per annum. Um, I think New York you you have your application starts at five thousand dollars but but all the other paraphernalia that you have to have in place is going to push you into uh, tens or even hundreds of thousands. Um, this isn't a kind of industry or technology specific regulation. This isn't a regulation that's about uh, um, all manner of uh, standards and um, uh, uh, methods of operation. This is rather just about money laundering and, uh, and that's uh, uh, what you might describe as a light touch regulatory regime. It'll, it'll force um, bad actors to think twice about coming to the Isle of Man whilst allowing um, genuine well-run businesses to thrive and prosper. Um, so I would say the Isle of Man is a, is a wonderful destination and you can go there now and you can set up business now very quickly and simply. I've done this for a number of clients recently and it really is a good jurisdiction to get things off the ground if, you, if, you, um, uh, if, if, if you've got a good reputation. Very easy, very welcoming, um, very accommodating. You're going to be able to sit down with the regulator to a certain degree and discuss things um, if you have questions before you submit your application. Those sorts of, that's a sort of very can-do attitude, very helpful attitude. Today's magic word is treasury. T-R-E-A-S-U-R-Y. Go to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim you're a part of a listener reward. So, well, before we wrap up, you know, we wanted to talk about uh, other things that have happened since we have you on. And, uh, since you are quite knowledgeable about these topics, uh, talk about uh, what's happening in the U.S. But before that, like, I just want to get an idea, uh, coming back to this uh, Her Majesty's Treasury uh, document we were talking about. So where, where do we go from here? What are the next steps uh, that need to be taken in order for actual regulation to come to be passed in the U.K.? And, and how long can we see that occurring? Um, it's not going to be an overnight thing. I think the expectation is um, perhaps that uh, suddenly things will, will be different. It, this announcement, this budget announcement and the paper that you refer to is, is, is an indication of policy. This is government policy, uh, but it has to be translated into, into, into something real. So there'll be a consultation phase that takes place after the, new, um, after the elections in, in May. Um, I suspect that will take a few months. They'll then uh, draft some legislation. Um, it very much depends in what form that legislation takes. My guess is that that uh, will be done in a, a, a relatively 
simple and straightforward way. So I would say we'll see something actually something for real in the sort of six to twelve months time frame. Um, the the business about funding uh, the the ten million for uh, research that money has already been allocated. It's in the um, it's in the the budget. The money has been put aside for, for for this next financial year starting in April. So that's um, that, that that things could happen there even sooner. And do we have any ideas to what this research could be? Well, it's whatever it's what it's whatever the the, re, the research research bodies uh, will will sort of apply for some of this money to 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 carry out some research project. I suspect it'll be mainly focused on the things on sort of future potential um, applications for um, for blockchain, um, sort of bleeding edge stuff um, to look at. The, the possibilities, and I suppose research can take sort of six months, twelve months projects uh, before you get some some things drop out. But you know, if you start to put money into it, things start to happen. So I think it will be good. Now, do you think that uh, that this paper and the conclusions that uh, that it draws perhaps sends a signal to other uh, European jurisdictions or even the European Union as to what type of approach uh, those other bodies should also be? Um, what, what other pro what approaches they should take to uh, Bitcoin regulation? I should be very surprised if other leading um, jurisdictions in Europe uh, won't um, won't won't start to focus on it. They won't want to uh, lose the uh, potential venture capital money that would otherwise certainly be attracted to the UK by this kind of environment, the, the, the environment that's being signalled now. Um, uh, you know, they want startups to come to um, uh, to uh, Paris or perhaps even Lille uh, or Berlin or uh, other um, European centres. So absolutely, I think others will be. So um, let's let's just very briefly uh, come to the the news. Uh, you mentioned uh, the Financial Action Task Force. Um, what is it, and what's going on there with regards to Bitcoin? Uh, the Financial Action Task Force is an international body that sets the recommendations for anti-money laundering, and the countries around the world sort of then subscribe to those rules and uh, measured one against the other by their adoption of those sort of standards. Um, quite interestingly, uh, it's holding a, a public sector consultation here in Brussels uh, this week. It's on today and uh, tomorrow. Are you going to be attending that? I will be at, uh, there tomorrow for the virtual currency session. And, um, and that's really why uh, it's worthy of mention here today because uh, they're giving a lot of time to looking and consulting with the industry about the specific anti-money laundering challenges. They recognize that the old way of doing things that they'd set their standards around may not be wholly appropriate to uh, digital currencies and so need to look at well, what are the underlying aims and how can they uh, of anti-money laundering and what, how can they achieve those aims with this new stuff that's crypto. So they will uh, issue recommendations that then national governments may implement in some ways, or yes, they, they will. They came out with a paper last summer, which was sort of a, a, a reason, reasonably um, a, a appropriate, well written, uh, demonstrated good understanding of, of digital currencies, uh, but but had no idea how they were going to sort of apply um, anti money laundering to it. And that, that thinking's obviously been going on, and they're now at a consultation stage. And I suspect in the summer they'll come out with some new recommendations how that could best be done in with digital currencies. So Fantastic. I think that's good. And there's one other thing, just briefly worth mentioning. One of the other topics they're discussing at this meeting is this business of de-risking that we talked about earlier on. Um, they they they're actually on our side. They don't like the fact that banks have used used anti-money laundering as an excuse for de-risking. They, they feel that uh, anti-money laundering shouldn't be a blanket reason for um, 
you know, uh, closing or not opening accounts for Bitcoin businesses or remittance businesses and so on and so forth. They feel that that is not in the spirit of the thing, that the spirit of the thing is about assessing risk and taking appropriate action, what they call the, the risk-based approach rather than the prescriptive you know, box ticking exercise. And they don't like the fact that banks seem to be um, using it as a sort of broad brush wholesale excuse. And they're, they're debating that very subject also tomorrow. So that's really an interesting thing. They're actually on our side. They want the banks to open up. If for no other reason, by the way, than that they fear that if banks you know, keep their doors closed to all these innovations, that the money will still flow, uh, but in unauthorized ways, and therefore the aims of anti-money laundering will be, uh, will be, uh, will, 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 will be lost. It will be an unintended consequence. But um, uh, yeah, it's an interesting development. Excellent. And, and then I guess that the sort of looming thing you know, that has been most discussed, most prominent uh, in the Bitcoin space with regards to regulation. Uh, is the bid license proposal. Now the last draft came out for comment period on, on March 4th and it said it was a 30-day period. I uh, know it was February 4th and that 30-day period where one could still submit comments ended on, on March 4th and uh, we, we talked with you about this briefly and, and your uh, point of view was sort of that there probably wouldn't be a lot more changes and, and we might actually see this very soon sort of passed as law um, what what has been proposed and, and what is sort of in the last in the last uh, version. So, what do you expect? Uh, do you expect that to happen in the next in the next month? Or I expect it to ha happen quite soon. So we had one draft that was a very controversial draft. It had a uh, an extended um, uh, comment period, and uh, many of the comments were acted on and uh, were reflected in the uh, revised version that you, you've just talked about. Uh, we're now at the end of the much shorter comment period for, for, for that. I'm not anticipating any significant um, uh, changes, maybe none at all. And um, uh, the way that it works in New York State is that this, uh, this set of regulation uh, doesn't need to go through any legislative process, so it's been issued by the um, New York State Department of Financial Services, and when it's ready, it'll say this is now the law, and that's the law. Yeah, I mean that, that I, I expect I, will be relatively soon. Yeah, I mean I, I think you know you mentioned that the, the, some of the comments have been addressed, but uh, you know I remember reading through that and I was like, this is insane. Uh, and uh, and it may be true that like you know in some minor ways this war, war was addressed, but I still think it is a completely uh, completely crazy what they, these guys have come up with. And I remember one of the one of the things they mentioned in there, which I find is perhaps the most absurd, is that there is this provision in there that any company that's licensed under the license has to do KYC on both parties to each transaction they're involved in. So, I mean, in my view at least, if one interprets that, you know, let's say Coinbase gets uh, regulated and then if I have a Coinbase account, well, wouldn't that mean if I send money to someone else, uh, Coinbase needs to know who the other person is, including identity, address, etc., etc. And actually, if you take it further, I mean, logically, it should also include incoming transactions, which of course is completely incompatible with Bitcoin. So I, I'm really curious how this is all going to turn out. Uh, I think there are some very real challenges um, to meet this um, set of regulation. I mean, one, one, one almost even more absurd sort of um, approach is that the um, the money transmission sort of world. Um, uh, sort of in the existing regulated sectors um, has um, have rules about having to uh, having information about the payer uh, travel with the transaction so in other words uh, uh, when you I don't know when you send euros from Berlin to um, to Lille 
um, across, well actually no, that's probably not a good example because within Europe, uh, within the EU that's not quite true, but um, let's say you had to send some, some, some dollars from Berlin to, to, to New York, information about you as the payer has to be sent with the message to the receiving bank. Um, so if you like, information about the source of the funds travels with the transaction and of course that really is an impossibility with um, with Bitcoin so there are going to be some very real challenges in how this stuff applies um, obviously businesses are going to have to look very carefully at how they how they structure their business models uh, in order to comply or indeed whether as in many cases I suspect whether they want to do business in New York at all well, and, and of course, of course, the the, the interesting interpretation of uh, the what these New York regulations apply to make that extremely challenging, you know, because it's basically any New York user. Well, it applies, right? And then, as far as I know, even if there's a New York user who isn't actually located in New York, it may apply. I mean, okay, maybe. Maybe it will be enough if you block IP addresses. I guess we'll see. Well, no, it probably isn't enough. That's that's that. I mean, you've highlighted a really interesting point. Um, the the as drafted, the. Um, scope is about the widest we've ever seen in 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 what's known as extraterritoriality. In other words. Um, uh, it, the way it's been drafted is that if any part of the transaction a transaction is involves in any way somebody who is from New York or is involved in um, any business relating to New York. Um, it's this use of the term involved in and it doesn't just mean that the transaction itself might involve New York, um, it might have nothing to do with New York but the person who has sent it or is receiving it has something to do with New York even though they aren't a New York resident. Um, brings it within the scope of this um, regulation and essentially if, if anybody contravenes it if you should have been licensed with a bit license and you failed to do so and it subsequently comes out you could um, you know you could be arrested and jailed in New York for having breached a New York law even though you have nothing to do with New York the payer has nothing to do uh, sorry isn't based in New York doesn't live in New York and neither does the recipient but simply because of some tenuous involvement yeah I mean that's just uh, that is just, just completely crazy I mean I think that's a really uh, sort of imperialism or an imperialistic <laughs> attitude uh, to law uh, at its worst and I mean I think it will be interesting to see what happens obviously it makes no sense and obviously people will be violating I mean the vast majority of Bitcoin businesses will be in violation of this law or, or do you sponsor shapeshift quite obviously it does not uh, completely clear that they're going to be violating the law I mean it, pretty much any business is going to be violating this law well, there are other challenges as well, and ones that have cost implications because there's, um, as in most regulated uh, financial sector, there's an element of due diligence that has to be carried out on one's clients. So you have to know who your client is and understand their business and so on and so forth. And uh, that comes in different sort of levels of sort of depth, if you like, how, how far you have to dig if you like and that it's most extreme um, it's known as enhanced due diligence and you really do have to do an awful lot of work when you know to prove an awful lot of stuff the New York regulations say that if uh, any person involved in the transaction is not a, a US citizen then you have to do enhanced due diligence in any event so you could be a French business Bitcoin business, handling a transaction for someone from the United Kingdom on one end and Germany at the other end. Uh, but because you also do some business in New York, you're licensed in New York, then you have to carry out uh, enhanced due diligence on the person in the UK and the person in, in Germany, even though that transaction has nothing whatsoever to do with with, with the U.S. Uh, and that, that there are huge costs and barrier. You know, it, it makes it hard to do business, and so people will go elsewhere uh, to businesses that are not licensed in New York.
Yeah, I mean, I, I think the consequences, in my view, is pretty clear. You know, so first of all, uh, there is a, a huge incentive uh, for people to develop software that is located, uh, operated locally, right? So let's say we use we use Electrum. Well, that's just open source software. He has mm -hmm. no control, so obviously that's you know that it doesn't really apply. So that there's a huge uh, incentive to do things like that. And then the other thing is, you know, you can go offshore and just say, like, whatever, I don't care about the um, U.S. laws. And and I guess that may have as a consequence, I presume, that the founders or the management staff should perhaps avoid traveling to the U.S. And uh, there could be uh, consequences like that. And, and I think the third thing is it's going to be a, a really huge competitive advantage for any company that is regulated in, in New York because... Who would want to use it? Uh, and it increases massively their cost. Uh, so it's it will be extremely interesting, I think, how this all turns out. Absolutely. And um, it's quite interesting there, too, because the whole of the states isn't New York. I mean, obviously, New York is the largest financial center in the states, one of the largest financial centers in the world. Uh, in the world but um, the approach is not universal in New York there's a slightly different approach in in California California is the world's sixth largest economy in its own right just as one state it's still a global scale economy and of course it's home to Silicon Valley where many Bitcoin startups and venture capitalists are based and uh, it's just uh, started it's just uh, launched a bill it's gone to a committee this week for the first stages of consideration uh, on uh, licensing um, digital currency businesses or exchanges at any rate and bringing them into line with sort of money uh, transmission type laws. Um, unlike New York's 46 page, I think it is, um, regulations, uh, the, the California one is, is four pages and much more light touch and so you'll have competition between states in the United States but you also have competition from abroad uh, outside of the states you were talking earlier about Europe and um, the European approach is far more consultative I do an awful lot of work here in Brussels with the uh, European Digital Currency and Blockchain Technology Forum which is a, a public policy platform a, a kind of um, advocacy um, uh, resource to the European Parliament and and the Commission and other institutions and they are hungry for information about uh, this stuff I mean we, we, we're consulting uh, giving advice briefing members of European Parliament and um, and others addressing meetings uh, virtually every month one form or another and we're organizing a big um, expo which uh, one of the MEPs has sponsored in the Parliament in the first week of November specifically to feed this um, this thirst for knowledge before they even start on uh, on um, thinking about regulation and this is this is excellent news because what it means is they're going to be much more measured and so yes you're absolutely right there will be much more competition between jurisdictions yeah so um well, I think we're at the, the end of our show. I mean, we could definitely talk about regulation uh, much longer, and, and I'm sure we will come back to this topic because uh, it's just the reality that it's a very important topic when it comes to uh, establishing Bitcoin businesses and getting big people to use Bitcoin, integrating it, and, and sort of making, uh, making progress with uh, this cryptocurrency revolution we're all working on. And if, I'm, if I might add, Brian, so I agree with everything you're, you were saying regarding New York and how how it is become it is it will probably become some sort of a handicapping um, characteristic of that state where you know Bitcoin businesses are not going to want to go there, and uh, and also it becomes a problem for just you know founders of companies uh, outside of New York who may want to travel there. So um, I, I'm. Very much looking forward to seeing what will happen uh, in terms of uh, where startups will want to establish uh, once this law passes. That's I think that's that's a I think that's a great point you're bringing up, right? So because right now, uh, if you look at venture capital investment in Bitcoin space, it's extremely unbalanced in that almost all of it is, or the vast majority of it is in the United States. So maybe that's going to have a positive effect on Bitcoin in Europe. That more 
uh, companies move over here. Uh, well, Certainly, that's that's the hope of say the UK government. Then, in in its policies, is to make the UK very attractive and bring venture capital funding into the UK, and to uh, bring startups, encourage startups in the UK. So instead of um, folks flying across and starting their businesses in in California, in Silicon Valley, and so forth, there'll be you know there's there are incentives for them to come to to um, uh, to London, the the big fintech center uh, in around uh, Silicon Roundabout, for example. So yes, um, the, 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 there's a lot of jockeying for position going on. I wouldn't write off New York entirely. I think the startups will probably tend to avoid New York uh, because. Hey, you know it's it's huge overhead and um, cumbersome, and they they may lose, um, you know, competitive advantage that they could get a gain elsewhere. But um, certainly the big money, um, you know, think back a few weeks ago to to the New York Stock Exchange putting uh, putting in uh, towards seventy five million dollars was it into uh, into Coinbase. Um, you know, the, the the established the blue chip world will definitely. I think gravitate towards uh, somewhere like New York uh, because it it benefits from the from those standards and actually the costs of regulation uh, for big business, really big business, traditional business is quite small. Yeah. So uh, yeah, Sean, th thanks so much for joining us for, uh, for a bit of a regulatory update. Uh, we hope uh, you know you as listeners uh, enjoyed it and and got something out of it, and perhaps it will give you some guidance and help when it comes to uh, your own activities in this space. Um, so uh, thanks so much for listening. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter if you want to, Epicenter BTC, and we'll be back uh, one week from now with another episode. So thanks, and until then. <laughs>